In this video, I want to talk a little bit about verbal communication, or what we sometimes commonly call language. So the words that we choose when we're communicating. So first of all, some things we need to know about the nature of language. First, language is symbolic. It's not magical. It's just a representation of ideas. These, these uh, letters and graphic representations that we created as a people. It's symbolic of ideas, though. It represents ideas. There's nothing magical about it. Secondly, language is arbitrary, mostly. It's not always arbitrary, but most language is just made up. It doesn't really have any connection to, like, the word cat. It doesn't have any connection to the animal. It's not what the animal sounds like or looks like or whatever. It's just some words that we put together, some letters we put together, and made a word and said, this is what we're going to use to describe this particular animal. C-A-T stands for cat, and this is what it sounds like. Now, language is sometimes not arbitrary, like when we have words like buzz and things and boom that sound like the things that they represent. Uh, so that's what we call onomatopoeia, when a word uh, sounds like and is pronounced like what the thing is that it represents. Then it's not arbitrary, but the vast majority of language is arbitrary. Language is also governed by rules, and we have a, a variety of sets of rules that we use to govern language and that, that rule language and how we use it. Um, first, we have phonological rules, which have to do with how language is pronounced, how we pronounce words, and how we pronounce different letters, and how we pronounce letters when they're in combination with something else. But it has to do with the pronunciation of those, those letters. We also have syntactic rules, which is how we use um, language in order, for example, the, the order of you know, what goes first, the noun or the the, 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 the pronoun or the, the you know, adjective and things like that. So, for example, in English, we would say um, the big red car. Um, and we would put the, the descriptives in front of that noun. So big and red go in front of the noun. But in other languages, such as Spanish, they would say, uh, in, in rough translation in English, they would say the car big and red. So they put the descriptives afterwards. So there are different syntactic rules that govern those situations. Syntax also rules um, things like the use of punctuation. And those would be uh, syntactic rules that govern punctuation. When do we use a, a period or a comma? And, you know, does the punctuation go inside the quotations or outside of it? And those are syntactic rules, what we call syntactic rules, rule syntax. We also have semantic rules, which have to do with the use of language in context. So um, how do we know what word is appropriate to use in which situation and, and the relational rules that surround that, those types of things are, are semantic rules. And then finally we have pragmatic rules, which are just, they govern the practical use of, of language in everyday use. So um, so we have all these different rules that govern language and, and that we can get to know that, that every language has these rules and every language has different rules that govern it. Um, but every every language will have all these different types of rules. A little more about the nature of language. Language is also subjective. It's not going to be viewed the same by every person. Every word has the ability to, to have different meanings and multiple meanings. And, and by this we mean that language, actually, every word has actually two different types of meaning. What we call the denotative meaning is the dictionary meaning. Meaning, if we were to look that word up in the dictionary, what would we find? And regardless of how you feel about that uh, particular word, then it's going to be the same, because we're looking in the same resource, we're looking it up in the dictionary, so it has that, that common connective meaning. Um, but then we also have the connotative meaning, which is how that word impacts you as a person, what relationship you have with that word or that idea, what it's, what it's representing, what that word is representing. And that's what we call the connotative meaning, and it's going to be highly individualized for each person. So you have the denotative meaning and the connotative meaning of the world and word. And this is really well uh, kind of laid out in, in Ogden and Richard's semantic triangle, which is just a representation, a conceptual model of, uh, of the different um, types of uh, meaning behind words. So um, first of all, they have, we have the semantic triangle, and it's called a triangle because there are three different points for each one. First, you have the symbol itself, the word itself. What collection of letters we have together here? For example, in this one, it's home, H-O-M-E. And so what do we think when we, home, if, when we think of home? If we were to look it up in the dictionary, we would probably find some descriptive about or description about, you know, home as, as a dwelling where people live and it has walls and doors and windows and, and so forth. And a home may look different in different cultures, but basically we're going to find it some sort of domesticated dwelling where people uh, tend to reside. That's the denotative definition of home, whether whether you... You know, regardless of your personal feelings, that's what we would find in the dictionary, and that's the denotative meaning. 
And for some people, home may represent this. This may be home, though. Home is where your heart is, right? Home is where your family is, wherever you can hang with your with your family and your people and, and just kind of be comfortable. That's that's home to some people. That So um, so home has this connotative meaning for some people that it's a pleasant place. It's not, not the structure itself, but it's where the people are at, right? But for other people, we may look at the same symbol, home, and we have the same denotative definition, of course. We have the structure where people live, right? But home for them is not such a pleasant place. Maybe it's a place that they don't want to go, where people argue and they fight and, and so forth. So home may not be the best, uh, has a negative connotation to them, may not bring up the best feelings for them, right? So we could do the same thing with almost every word. So if we took the word baseball, for example, the symbol is just baseball, right? The, the, that collection of letters, and we recognize how to pronounce it, and it's just called baseball, right? So if we were to look at baseball denotatively in the dictionary, we would find that it's both a ball, and there would be, you know, there are specific parameters about the ball and the weight and the size and that kind of thing. And then it's the game as well, right? It's the game of baseball with one player bat and nine in the field and three strikes and four balls and so forth to, so regardless of your personal feelings about baseball, that's what baseball is, right? Denotatively, objectively, but subjectively and connotatively, baseball could mean different things to different people. Maybe you love baseball. Maybe you hate baseball. Maybe the word baseball makes you think of playing baseball as a kid or, or going to your kid's baseball games or, or uh, you know, any other number of things. Or maybe you just think, I don't like it. Right. I don't like baseball. So um, so maybe baseball brings up a variety of different um, feelings for you, depending on your situation. And connotatively, that's what we mean. It'll bring up different that symbol will have different meanings for each individual. Continuing on with the nature of language, then language is also bound by context and culture. And by that, we mean it's created by and it's specific to a particular culture. So language is going to, to be dependent on that context and, and the use of that language and the meaning of that language depends on that context and depends on the culture in which it's found. Right? So for example, just just some pop slang of the 2000s. So these are words that were popular in the 2000s at different points of the 2000s, meaning between 2000 and 2010, that era or whatever, um, at, that, that, that have gone out of style that we don't use anymore. Nobody says, uh, nobody really says bootylicious anymore. Nobody says awesome sauce. Nobody says things like that or cray, fosheezy. These are things that are specific to that culture and they are bound by that culture, right? So outside of that culture, they tend not to make sense. But when you use them in relationship to that culture, then they then they make perfect sense, right? So, um, so language is bound by context and culture. It's created by and specific to that particular culture. This also connects to what we call a Saper Whorf hypothesis, um, which has two different um, things related to it. Uh, both have to do with linguistics. So the first is linguistic determinism, and what Saper Whorf hypothesis says about this is that um, our language, the language we grew up learning and, and knowing and speaking and, and writing and things, will determine our view of our culture. So if we if we grew up in a culture where there are you know a hundred words for money and only one word for love, then what does that tell us about what that culture values? That culture values money, right, and values um, power and things. We we tend to have more words for things that we value. So um, that determinism will will show us the importance of those things. In, through our linguistics if we learn that language. Um, we can also look at it in terms of linguistic relativity, um, in terms of if we were to examine a culture and exclusively by their language, then we could learn certain things about that culture from that language, like the fact that the Eskimos have you know, between 50 and 100 words for snow, depending on which study you look at. They have a bunch of words for snow. We can look at that and say, well, snow must be very important to them, as opposed to a culture where they only have one word for snow because they hardly get any. Um, then we can determine that snow is not quite as important to them. We can determine things about that culture based on <clears throat> based on their language. What we can we can learn things about that culture, or at least make assumptions about that culture based on their language. So shifting gears here a little bit, uh, let's talk about the impact of language and some of the different ways that language impacts things. First of all, language has a critical impact in naming and identity, both for individuals. I mean, think about your name, or if you have children, what did you name your children? Do you think your parents thought about what they were going to name you, or did they just draw it out of a hat? Probably has some sort of significance, right? Why you got the name that you got. <clears throat> so uh, naming is an important, uh, language has a huge impact on us through naming. That's also true for groups, um, groups who decide what they're going to be called. You know, some groups, you know, band geek used to be a, a really kind of a harsh term that people use, but now I think some groups have kind of 
uh, some band groups have kind of adopted it. They've kind of said, yeah, I'm a band geek. I like that. And so we're going to we're going to claim that for ourselves. So um, the impact of language on naming and identity for groups is also uh, impactful. Uh, affiliation. We use language to, to denote affiliation or disaffiliation with a certain group. When we adopt the language of a group or, uh, you know, adopt the lingo that goes along with working in a certain place or being a part of a certain club, then that uh, that gives a sense of affiliation that we want to be a part of that group. As opposed to if we resist the language of that group and refuse to kind of use and learn that language, then we're signaling that we don't want to be affiliated with that group. So it can be impactful in terms of affiliation. Uh, in terms of power and politeness, we can make language choices that, that denote or indicate you know, a sense of power over somebody else, or we can choose to use language that is more polite, and, and those are important distinctions. Uh, the language of sexism and racism, again, language choices that relate to and communicate how we feel about those things and, and the impact of those things. Some more impact of language has to do with precision and vagueness. So uh, we have what we call ambiguous language, language that is uh, intentionally vague or uh, uh, and, and abstract. So, and abstraction exists uh, so on on different levels and, and on on a spectrum. So, on one end, you have very abstract language, which is unclear and non-precise, and on the other hand, you have what we call concrete language and concrete verbiage, uh, which is very specific and very precise. So, this is just an example of a, a ladder of what we call the ladder of abstraction. You can see at the top on both sides there are different topics on each side, but you can see at the top we have very abstract ideas such as war. Or dog, those could mean a lot of different things to a lot, you know, to each pe each person, and bring different things to mind. But the further down the ladder we go, we get into that concrete detail, away from abstraction, and into very specific ideas that kind of bring everybody to the same page. So uh, both can be appropriate depending on the situation. It just depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to be abstract, or are you trying to be concrete? Then you need to make uh, different language choices uh, that would help you achieve those goals. I also have. Uh, in terms of precision and vagueness, we sometimes use euphemisms. This is an example of euphemism for um, for dying. We don't like to say somebody has died a lot of times, so we say they passed away. Or if we're joking around, we may say they kicked the bucket. Or so they passed on anything to not say dead or dying. Right? We use these euphemisms to kind of soften up things and soften up our language use. Relative language. You know, are you from a big town or a small town? Well, that depends. Some people would say they're from a small town if they're from a town of 10,000 people. I grew up in a town of 500 people, which is small to me. So a town of 10,000 people is actually fairly large. Uh, and, of course, cities are, are huge, but it really just depends. So are you are you tall or are you short? Well, that depends. Who am I comparing myself to? So uh, we have to think about language in terms of relativity as well. And, and in terms of precision and vagueness, we, you don't want to use language that's relative if you're trying to communicate something very specific. And then static evaluation, uh, the idea of uh, things change, and sometimes we don't indicate that through our language. Sometimes we speak about people and things as though they are they're static. They never change, right? But but that's not the case. Things change, and so we need to indicate that through our language use. Um, genders will also use uh, language differently, uh, but, but there's two approaches to this. One says that there are significant differences and that men and women are from different planets, essentially. Um, the other says that there are minor differences. Instead of men are from Mars and women are from Venus, it's men are from North Dakota and women are from South Dakota. Um, the truth is, the more we learn about um, gender and gender differences in, in communication, we find that most of the major differences that we see are not biological or physiological. We're not wired differently. We're not from different planets so much as we've been socialized so differently over the last couple thousand years. So we see those changes and those differences shrinking as as the as we start to view gender and communication differently and recognize that it's not so much that women are naturally inclined to, to speak this way or to, to behave this way so much as this is how they've been trained to behave and the same for men this is how we've been trained to behave so um, so the verdict is probably leaning toward minor differences rather than major differences in the in the genders and their communication use so, so what are some things we can do to improve languages here real quickly uh, first we can use confirming messages positive messages and we can minimize disconfirming messages that convey a lack of value right we can do what we can to avoid making others defensive. We can provide effective feedback, constructive, productive feedback to people using our language. We can own our thoughts and feelings instead of trying to put them on somebody else. We can take ownership of those things and, and indicate that through our language use. We can separate opinions from factual claims. When we're stating something, you know, 
instead of saying, oh, that's just, that's terrible, and this is, this is terrible, say, in my opinion, this is terrible, unless it's a factual claim. We need to separate those things. And we can create positive climates in electronic communication as well. We can be more intentional about that. Whatever questions you have about language and verbal communication, please feel free to email me. In the meantime, happy communicating.